Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Ramp Chat webinar today. This is Polly Trailer with OpsRamp, and today we're going to be talking about how our company uses our solution, OpsRamp, to run our SaaS operations. So I'm really excited to talk about this, and I have with me today Pivivi Raju. He is our Director of Cloud Operations. And we are gonna walk through, um, first of all, a little bit of description about our SaaS environment and what are some of the challenges that a lot of organizations have in, in running a 24 by seven operation as well as one that is globally distributed. We're gonna talk about changing customer requirements this year. There have been uh, a few. Global scalings, uh, excuse me, global scaling, access and security how to be really efficient with this, as well as our metrics and how we are working to improve them. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring up PVV on the live video here and um, say hello, how are you? Hey, hi Polly, how are you? Good to have you here and you are dialing in from Hyderabad today. Yeah. Which is where yeah. you're working yeah. with. Yeah. Very good. Yes, I'm currently, currently in so Hyderabad. I'm like Excellent. In the evening for you, so we appreciate you taking time out of your evening to talk about no this, and it's something um, that you know very well, right? Yeah, I've <laughs> been doing this for a long time, so yeah, <laughs> so should be able yes. to. Uh, Since uh, at least 2016, if maybe not earlier, am I, do I have that correct? You've been uh, doing this? Yeah, so, yeah, so I'm being one of the early employees of OpsRAM, and I think in 2015, end of 2015, I started getting actively involved in this and from the last uh, uh, three years i have been uh, handling the SaaS operations uh, you know, leading it scaling and all those things yes fantastic okay so i thought it'd be good to just um start by you just describing our environment um how our infrastructure is distributed where we host um the application and maybe even go over a little bit about um, what we actually manage, how many devices and resources we manage for our customers. Yeah, so you know, as 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 you all know, right? OpsRamp is a, a SaaS platform that is used for managing the digital operations, right? The whole lifecycle management, uh, the alert management, incident management, everything, right? So we we also implement, we also have the AI ops implemented for improve reducing the noise levels and improving the operational efficiencies. That's the one-liner of the platform that we do, right? So to deliver this kind of a platform, we we deploy something called pods. Pod is like a point of delivery. So it has like multiple locations uh, from the software is delivered. Uh, at this point of time, uh, we have around 10 pods worldwide, you know, North America, Canada, Europe, Japan, kind of things, right? We have everywhere. and. Uh, Based on the geography, based on the access to the data centers, we deploy these solutions either in the data centers or in the public cloud. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point of time, um, we manage around 1.3 to 1.4 million resources and uh, process around uh, close to 6, 6.5 billion metrics per day. Okay. Wow. And wow. Repeat that. How many billion metrics a day? Three points. Around six. I think six to six point five, somewhere okay. in between, wow. okay. per day. and we uh, process around uh, close to five hundred million events per day. So across across the globe, right? Across multiple parts of those kind of things. That's what we do uh, as on today. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks for walking me through that. I want to bring up a slide here that you created, and and I want to talk yeah. about those odds um, because that's interesting, right? And this has grown over time, but. Um, yeah. Here's um, our, our global pods, and I'd like to have you talk just a little bit about that and as well how we do that with an ops ramp, how we manage that. Yeah, so yeah. So first, before we go there, right, so there are a couple of things I just want to bring it up. First of all, you know, as a SaaS platform, there are some standard uh, metrics that we need to be very closely uh, you know, adhering to our monitoring. First one is the availability. The next one will be scalability, and uh, the third one is the innovation, right? How fast you can innovate and how fast you can deploy new things and all these things. Okay. To achieve that, we obviously need uh, went with this kind of a deployment model where a, a, a pod, which is basically a point of delivery, has two locations, and both are in active active mode. That means uh, you know, they are in, for disaster recovery, a failover, and everything. Okay. 
given that, for example, in Europe when we start, started building the pod, you know, obviously we had to build a lock in the local environment because of the uh, data restriction policies and everything. So we choose two locations and build the pod. And at that point of time, we went to the public cloud. So at each, uh, in each location, um, we go with the available infrastructure elements. Um, in US, we have both data central based deployments as well as public cloud. Uh, in Europe, it's public cloud. In, in Japan, it's public cloud kind of a thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So given all these things, uh, it poses a different kinds of challenges. First of all is uh, to make sure that we have a complete visibility across multiple infrastructure elements, whether it can be a data center, it can be a public cloud, it can be a, you know, anywhere, right? Uh, so that is first challenge. And, uh, and the second thing is having access or having manageability for all of these devices from one single source. One single point, right? And I can't have like okay to manage this, you have to do this. For managing this, you have to do this. So it it creates a lot of operational inefficiencies and kills a lot of time. Right? That's the second thing. And the third thing is obviously if something happens, how do we know? I'm the first to know, right? The first to know kind of a thing. So we need to figure out uh, how we can fastly find the root cause and all those things. So that's what. Uh, the key challenges are here. And uh, the way we do it is we implement OpsRAM within OpsRAM, right? So we onboarded all our pods within OpsRAM as clients so that the operations team, which is operating out of India as well as US, can look everything in one single login. And uh, all these logins are uh, SSO based uh, logins, sorry, single sign on based logins. So they can just log in and see based on their roles, based on their permission sets. They can see the all the infrastructure, whatever is there. They can manage it at one place. Uh, they can look at the monitoring. They can access them. They can they can do all those things, right? So it's it's one of the I would say the best use case uh, on on how we should manage like a worldwide spread multiple parts from a single interface. And you know today the option that that we are developing. Is, is helping us to manage the same and you know, con you know control the whole thing. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. Um, awesome, thanks for that, we're back live. So um, so that's great. So, so ultimately, you know, we, we are using OpsRamp the way that we want our customers to use OpsRamp um, by having everything in that one interface and also having the multi-tenant functionality in which you that can drill that. into each of those regions as you need. So let's talk a little about, you, you started to touch on this about access, um, obviously security, um, role-based access, those are things that we all have to do really well today. So can you talk yeah. a bit about um, how we're doing that in OpsRamp? Yes, so in OpsRamp from day one, the way it is built is, to, is based on a model called RBAC, it's role-based access control. So that means the person can access or have visibility based on the role he has. That means I'm just taking an example. If there is a database administrator, he only wants you only if you want to give access only to the database servers, you only give access to him. Okay. He can view the other IT assets, but the manageability and you know checking the monitoring, you know, adjusting thresholds and everything, he can do it only one resource. Right. So that's the first thing. So we leverage that very, very, very uh, you know heavily because of multiple teams doing on multiple things. Yeah. The second the major thing that I would talk about is uh, the whole security around login and remote. OpsRAM from day one uh, is built for remote infrastructure management, right? So now in these hard times of COVID and everything, we have people spread across multiple multiple uh, areas in the world. So it's no different for us from day one because everyone can remotely access securely. We have two-factor authentications, we have SSOs and we have role-based access. So indirectly, we did not see that much of a operational impact when it comes to the management point because uh, we got used to this kind of model and OpsRAM with all its security controls, with the user access, permission model, roles, uh, all those things is really helping us. And on top of it, we have something called, and all of you know it's about the remote access, right? Uh, when you do a remote access using OpsRAP, it gets recorded, it gets audited, and all those things. So that is also helping us. So I don't need to worry 
you know about VPNs, this, that, and everything. So everyone will go to one interface. Everything is audited. Uh, we have a we have a security and uh, audit team which reviews those on a regular basis to make sure nothing is happening and all those things. So it's pretty good. Uh, I would say uh, I don't see much difference because of of this thing because we got used to that kind of model from day one. Yeah. yeah. And the audit features um, are, are something that have been pretty important for customers, particularly in certain industries, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, there are some customers of us who use platform only for the remote access because of the HIPAA compliance, because of some of these compliances. Yeah. So, yeah, that's one of the most important functionality uh, for operations, especially, right? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, the problem on a server you have to log into the server and fix something or you have to run a script you have to do some configuration change and all those things uh, given that that can be done securely uh, you can be anywhere in the world uh, without any issues that brings a lot of value and reduces a lot of uh, heartburn when managing these kind of things yes okay excellent um and i wanted to ask you you know so during covid um we have two main offices in india and employees yeah. have been working at home primarily. And um, yeah. in some cases, some of our employees have been going, you know, leaving the big cities and moving back to their family and maybe in smaller towns. Yeah. And I'm wondering, has that posed any problems with connectivity or reliability of their connections in order for them to be able to keep doing their job? So you know, from a use case point of view or the way they're managing the operations, I did not see any challenge. Okay, obviously there will be one challenge where no, because you are you are staying in a remote place, you may not you may not have a bad, good connectivity and bad connectivity. Things may slow down a little bit, but as long as you have a decent connectivity, I don't see any challenge because of. That's good. So yeah, but obviously, if, they, if you don't have any internet, you can't really do much. So that's a story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Well. Okay. Well. Well. That's great. I'm I'm glad to hear that. Um, Let's move on, if you don't mind. And I wanted to talk about um, kind of the bigger picture. And I'm going to bring up another slide here. Um, and that is, you know, how you are. Whoops, here we go. Um, oh, nope, I missed it. Sorry. Um, so on this slide, if you could talk a little bit about how you are doing, you know, 24 by 7 op operations most efficiently. We have a lot going on. We're, we're in all three clouds, um, yeah. globally distributed. And we have integrations as well. So maybe you can just talk through that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, OpsRamp as a platform has multiple touch points, right? That means you have agents and gateways sitting in the customer environment that talk to the cloud. And there are, uh, you know, we have integrations into third party uh, public clouds like AWS, uh, Azure, GCP, where we pull the information. And uh, on top of it, we integrate with customer ITSM and monitoring tools, right? So there's a lot of moving parts here, and it's very, very important that uh, you make sure that you efficiently run this, right? That's the first thing. And the second thing is, uh, given the, uh, it's it's not like, okay, uh, no, it's not like a, some part of the day you use more, and uh, it's not like, you know, shopping site, right? where the traffic will be very high during a uh, holiday period and those kind of things. Right? In this case, given that agents and gateways are used for monitoring 24 by 7, uh, there is no off, off, you know, there is no peak hours or non-peak hours for us. It's always 24 by 7 uh, peak hours for us, right? So mm -hmm. we we use something called Alert Browser that is there in OpsRAM portal where to use this, that is to monitor everything. Uh, and uh, we use something called alert correlation to reduce the noise. So, for example, if something happens, for example, let's say uh, there is a BGP failure or there is a uh, interconnect failure and those kind of things, we immediately know instead of causing noise, we get one, two alerts, we act on it. And if there are issues within the system on the respective team, we get escalations, right? We use uh, email escalations, SMS escalations kind of a thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's on the uh, emails and all those things. And we also use something called auto incident policies uh, where the tickets are automatically created and assigned to the respective people and, they, and start working on it and all those things. And uh, given the uh, some of the features where we can integrate into a current roster, so I don't need to worry about who is there in the shift and all those things, right? 
given that it's a 24 by 7 we follow the sun model where we have offices in multiple places and multiple people are looking into it so we define the roster and the alert escalations and everything follow that model so that i don't it will go to the right member at the right time so they can act on it that's yeah. about the the monitoring making sure the platform up and running and all those things the second major part that uh, we really uh, you know that we monitor is given that it is a saas platform and a multi tenant uh, platform it has to scale uh, whenever based on the customer load and everything right so when as part of scaling when you add new resources or remove the current resources or whatever it is that should be pretty agile and very efficient so for that we use we use the feature called device management policies in opsramp so whenever we bring up a new instance through our automation or through runbook automation or whatever it is what it generally happens is the moment the instance come up the agent gets installed and then uh, through the device management policy the the monitors gets applied so i don't need to worry about okay so i added 10 more servers uh, to handle the scale are they getting monitored correctly or not kind of a thing so we integrated all those things using uh, some of the functionalities that are there in the ops ramp like device management policies defining custom monitors uh, you know scheduling uh, some of the runbook automations and all those things okay mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. on the scalability and flexibility part and the and the third item i would like to bring up is uh, uh, you know obviously because you are running our operations from multiple places and multiple teams are involved it's very important that the knowledge is 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 shared you know if someone knows something you know other people know and all those things right so the way we make we make sure is we use uh, the kb management internally that is there in the ops from very heavily that means uh, you know for example there is a standard operating procedure we write in that so that everyone knows and we tag that to that particular asset so when that same issue happens on the asset people can look at that uh, uh, you know kb article and act on it kind of a thing that is one thing we use and last but not the least uh, we use some you know security tools like ibm qradar and those kind of things uh, that we uh, you know integrate into our system so that we get uh, alerts and everything so there are some tools that uh, we have integrations so that we are you know monitoring it uh, completely but various things as well mm -hmm. so that's we we use opsramp to run our operations 24 by 7 okay great and so we talked about a lot of things you talked about um the alert browser the correlations um yeah. response policy I wonder if you could just wrap up here on this question with um, where are we at with getting to increased automation by using OpsRamp? Um, I don't know if you can describe like how automated everything is now versus where we want to be, let's say, yeah. in a few months or in a year from now. So from the pod deployment and how we scale the pod is kind of automated, uh, you know, I would not boast myself as 100%, but I think we are close to 99% when it becomes to you know deployments and all those things. But coming to automating some of the operational things, um, I think we are we are still improving. I, I I don't know if I can put a number there, but uh, so one of the features that we are trying and we are trying to improve is two areas. One is our RBS, which are runbook automations that we can run whenever an alert comes in. So what will happen with that is uh, my engineer doesn't need to do some of the standard activities kind of a thing especially something like a disk related activities and those kind of things and the other thing i'm really excited and we started playing with it and leveraging is the process automation where we want to integrate some of our uh, current processes with that automation so that we can reduce some of the manual tasks yes i i see that in the next uh, uh, i would say Three to six months, we will be using a lot of uh, these automations to to further improve our efficiencies, uh, so that we can scale much faster when it comes to the operations of managing the platform kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you for that. I know automation is something that a lot of teams are trying to do more, but trying to figure out how to balance that with um, 
their traditional workflows and the need to, you know, intervene with, with human insight as exactly. well. So, yeah, great. Um, let's talk about uh, something that's, you know, important to people across the organization, whether you are the IT executive or the IT admin or the SRE, and that is dashboards. Um, so maybe you can walk through a little bit about what kind of dashboards you can use with OpsRamp and what ones, which ones that we are using and how we use them? Yeah, so this is one of the dashboard that I that you're seeing on the screen, right? He's one he's one for our one of the data platform where we see all the metrics. So currently uh, we use uh, we use the dashboards for three areas. One is the capacity planning. So we want to see how the system is behaving the last one month or you know one week or kind of thing. So it uses a very good idea on how the system is behaving. The second thing is when you are trying to correlate multiple sources, it will give a very good analysis on where could be the performance bottlenecks. And it will, it will also use a easy way to find the root cause of some of these things. For example, if I'm trying to compare, so the dashboards that we create are primarily in two areas. One is we create dashboards from a technology point of view. That means how my Cassandra cluster is behaving, how is my uh, you know, database uh, is behaving, how is my app behaving kind of thing. So that gives a very good visibility. And we also try to create dashboards based on, on the use case. For example, uh, you know, there is a flow. If, if the app server is busy, then that would impact our response times, right? So based on those, we, we define all those widgets. So for everyone, for anyone and everyone who sees those dashboards in, in, in my team, he gets a fairly good idea that this could be the bottleneck that is causing this and acts fast. So that's how we use the dashboards. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, on and on top of it, we also use the service maps where we define all the how our how our application is laid out. So it will also help us to find the root cause much better. Uh, you know, for example, if either my data layer is having uh, performance issues or the app layer is performing issues. Okay. And this indirectly, the dashboards and the reports and reports also, we have this uh, reports that we generate, uh, the infrastructure reports, the alert reports, and all those things for measuring our KPIs and all those things. And this will also help us to look at any optimization that we can do in the infrastructure, right? For example, if there is a uh, some servers where we, some bottlenecks are there, we use this data uh, as input to our automation, which will scale up or scale down in those kind of things. So that's what we leverage our dashboard, service maps, reports, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I wanted to ask a follow-up question on the service maps. Um, what exactly do we mean by that? Maybe you can get an example of a couple of services that we monitor um, or that a customer would monitor. And why is it important to have a service map view? Yeah. So. At the end, uh, right? It's, it's very simple. Uh, everyone, what what everyone cares is is my service up and run is up is up and running, right? So internally, you may have a disk full alert on one of the VM. You may have a high memory on another VM. But if the service is running with enough redundancy and all those things, those things may not be you may not really care. So for me, what I really care about is how my services are behaving rather than how individual elements are behaving. So that is how I use the service map where we define an app cluster as a service and, and we define the DB layer as a service kind of a thing. And we include both these services to build the whole platform, right? So mm -hmm. if one of my app server is, you know, I have, we have a cluster of nodes and we know in one of the node has a problem that may not impact my service, right? So we also, service maps also helps us to define the critical path so, you know, if data layer is in the critical path, right, you know, but the job processing is not in the critical path kind of a thing. So yeah. the service maps that especially, you know, what I use or my team uses is more to do with uh, how we can quickly identify the service health rather than worrying about the individual elements. Got it. And that's a different view, right? Traditional IT operations were really much more yeah. Um, yeah. focused on on the individual components versus trying to bubble it up to what really matters. That's true. You are right. So I think we sh we are. I think the whole shift is more towards a uh, 
service rather than individual elements and how my each service is behaving rather we all i think yeah. people worry more about how my service is behaving so yeah very good okay we're going to go back live um all right so we're back um so i guess the last question and this is sort of like you know where where the it exec really wants to know how is this improving things in a quantifiable way um how are we um how does anybody improve their response times uh, mean time to resolution and how, what what kind of metrics are we seeing i guess um over time yeah so you know most of the organizations have like three four metrics that generally they use right first of all obviously the availability the second one is uh, how fast you are responding and how fast you are res resolving the issue right so those three um and maybe i will add a fourth one which i generally call as visibility you know can i see everything at one shot so you know uh, am i the first to know kind of a thing right so so yeah. in a way the, the way we are leveraging ops ramp is more or less on these four areas uh, for me the availability is more towards uh, the deployment model and how we deploy how we scale how we are maintaining the clusters and everything uh, but the remaining three parts are where uh, ops ramp is really helping first of all when i talk about how fast you can respond you know because of these uh, alert correlations because of this first first response and and escalations i can reach the right person in the shortest possible time rather than going to the whole chain of okay you have to call someone you have to call someone you have to call someone yeah that's one reduces it and also by leveraging the automation like a process uh, automation or the rpa those kind of things i can address some of the standard issues faster than they even being acted on manually right i can automate them and run the script and those kind of things so that is where it is really helping for uh, how i'm quickly responding to it right uh, coming to the resolution uh, so the key for any resolution is to, is to find the root cause faster right uh, if you find the root cause faster you can always resolve it faster so i believe that uh, given the way we use uh, the dashboards the service maps and all those things it really helps us to look the understand the impact much much faster and immediately you know, look go to the right area and start fixing the things so i believe that's what i you know we have been experiencing obviously yeah good it's and, and made, so yeah great um well, well those are good metrics and and um do you find that the metrics are changing a little bit um, as more organizations move to the cloud? Yeah. You know, yeah, know. so people when move more to the cloud, obviously there are some metrics they don't really care because infrastructure is no longer a, a problem, right? Someone else is managing it for you. So I think the metrics will be more on the service availability, uh, in, you know, how the customer responsiveness, I mean to say, customer experience and those kind of things. I believe that's yeah. where even in our case, we measure that, but I am an operations guy, so I talk more from the you know day-to-day -day operations. Sure, that's where. Yeah, that I mean the end user monitoring, the customer experience, experience monitoring is is a hot topic right now, and how to measure that I think is maybe a little less straightforward, but um, very. Yeah, very there are multiple ways to do that, right? For example, we use something called synthetics in our system to do that. But again, uh, there are multiple ways people measure it. Uh, it depends on your product. It depends on the use case. But uh, there are different ways to do it. At least in our case, we use something called synthetics that is already uh, in the product uh, to see how uh, users are. You know, we do some transaction monitoring, right? We so how the system is behaving yeah. for the transaction analysis. So we do all those things. Yes. Excellent. Okay, that's been a good overview. Um, you know, I've got to mention. I'm sorry, everybody, at the beginning that. Um, we do have a Q&A, and I'm going to just um, give everybody uh, who's on the session right now a moment to submit a question if you have it. You can use the question tool in the Bright Talk screen to do that. Um, let PVV get a sip of water if you need that. <laughs> OK, awesome. Great. Well, I do have a question, and it's funny because, um, you know, it, it seems like an obvious question, but I'm I'm really curious to know, like, what 
the answer would be here. So how does our internal use of our product inform our product roadmap or development efforts? Is that all a great thing? Are there sometimes conflicts with our engineering team about what we should include in the next um, iteration of our software? Yeah, that's a very good question, you know, putting me on spot, but yeah. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm the customer zero, right? Uh, obviously, uh, the team, this operations team here, uh, this, this has uh, operations team is the customer zero. So anything that the product develops, we are the first ones to use, uh, to give feedback and everything. So there, had been, there has been a ton of products that uh, the engineering and the product management developed for us right uh, to improve the efficiencies and there are a lot of feedback that we give based on how you know how to make a feature easy based on our experiences okay. it may not be 100 percent but you know based on our use cases we talk about can we do this can we make uh, some of these tweaks here and there so that it makes the life of a uh, you know a day-to-day -day operations much easier kind of a thing but in the long story short we are the customer zero uh, here for the product and we give a lot of feedback to product management. We give a lot of feedback to engineering, which, which they take and then refine it, generalize it, and start implementing in the future. So, so yeah, yeah, that's going on quite well at this time. Yes. <laughs> that, that's been really valuable, um, honestly. At, okay, let's see. So we have a I do have another question here. Um, so I think you covered this a little bit, but maybe there, you, you might have something else to add about it. And how has remote work affected? Um, your work and maybe just you individually um now you know maybe when things first started to um lock down as well as now that we're in kind of a new stage of whatever it is yeah so okay so first of all coming you know again this is my way of looking at things based on the team right so given that everyone is working remote there is definitely some challenges in the way we you know communicate and operate and everything we are getting more busy in meetings because of various things and all those things. While you are in the office, you can just say hi, walk to his desk and talk about it, right? But the yeah. problem now is, uh, you know, obviously different people are in different time zones. That is becoming a little different. And, you know, obviously I would say it added a little more stress to the team, uh, given that uh, uh, the operations office is 24 by seven uh, and you are working remote and the interactions are less. But yeah, but that's the way it is today. Uh, there is definitely some challenges, and we are trying to overcome that by by spacing over the way we do the activities, using more automations, using more technologies, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's funny because another question just came in um, about um, how has our automation, we're increasing our automation, helped? Um, it says the lifestyle health of ops professional. Maybe like has the fact that we are using more automation um, reduced stress of our people and maybe made their jobs more enjoyable. Yeah. So from so this is uh, if you are talking about uh, a general automation, so we deploy across all our parts in like an hour. All our uh, brand, all our uh, patch releases happen within an hour. OK, so there's a lot of automation that went in. There is a lot of rigor that we put in and all those things. OK. Earlier, that was used taking a lot of time. So there are definitely a lot of improvements we did uh, as part of automation with ops ramp and, and some standalone op, standalone automation, which definitely improved. I would say, uh, you know, maybe lifestyle and health are big words for me. But what I'm saying is, they can efficiently use their time. Right, whenever uh, instead of uh, blogging down on on one issue for a longer time they can quickly uh, fix some of these things and all this definitely automation i feel is the key driver for improving your operational efficiencies but obviously it's not 100 percent we may it depends on your use case and everything but yes that's that's true yeah yeah well that's good so so there's there's um some light at the end of the tunnel here for all of us working at home and maybe feeling isolated and not as productive as we might want to be. Well, this has been fun. Um, thank you so much for hanging with me today with all the questions. Um, I'm just going to bring up a slide here um, about some upcoming events that we have. Next week on Thursday, October 29th, um, we will be doing another event. And this time I will be chatting with Banu Singh and Karen Byrne. 
These are our senior product leaders here at OpsRamp. And we're going to be talking about a, a very common topic, um, legacy software, what to do about it, what's good, what's bad, um, you know, how do you figure this out, what to do with your legacy software. So I think that's going to be a fun conversation. Well, hopefully, uh, you can please join us for that, same format. And as well, you can check out other events at our event page. We have recordings of all of our events that you can watch on demand. And this one will be available on demand shortly after this session. So again, thank you so much, um, PBV, for your time. And it was a great discussion. Have a great day. Thank Good you. Evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.